Okay, so during that brief break, I uh, did a couple of things. Um, got this image rendered out here. Uh, this is what it should look like if you are... Oh, why, why are you not working? Make go bigger. There we go. Okay, it should look something like this if you've got it... Uh, if you've been following along and that sort of thing. You got your bokeh blurred particles back here, your environment lighting, adding a nice little backdrop, and you've got your Gorgon over here. Um, I added in motion blurring, and so if you, I don't know if you can really see this very well, but there is a slight amount of blurring that's happening because the Gorgon I animated to move from this top corner over here on frame one. Uh, he's about... 20 spaces or 20 blender units away, 20 meters away from this position. Um, on frame one, I had him uh, basically start 20 meters away, and then by frame 42, I had him appearing here, and then by frame 50, or not 50, uh, I think by frame like 70 something, I had him off the screen. So what motion blur does is simulate what it's what happens when you leave the shutter of your camera open um for an extended period of time uh instead of having an immediate shutter uh cap or no motion blurring so uh basically the image appears blurred between two points in space uh i think that's how it works something like that anyway it produces a cool and uh realistic effect that simulates you know what it's like when you are watching a fast object move so um, you know, like when you see a very fast, like Lambo, um, like Lamborghini or Ferrari or something speed by, I mean, you're, you're watching it go by, but you're not, you're not, unless you're focusing right on it, it, you know, it passes through your field of vision really fast. And so you see kind of like the trail of the car behind you. The car is actually moving faster than your eyes, your eye or a camera can actually detect. So what happens is the image of the car in your retina and in the lens of a camera is slightly distorted and that is what motion blurring basically is so i enabled uh motion blurring here in the uh render panel uh right above the film settings performance and all that and right below light pass you can enable it in the motion blur and i had it set to a very low value like 0.03 i tried some higher values and i mean it, it's good for active animation uh, to have like a higher shutter value, but because we're just uh, we're, we're rendering out a still image, I wanted to get the effect of like this thing is moving in the frame. However, I just I was able to take a quick picture of it, so it's slightly blurred, um, but I wanted to still be able to see uh, this all this good detailing in here. So I did not embellish on the motion blurring, but it is there. And to see it in your render, you need to activate, or to see it in your render layer, you need to activate the vector pass. And that will basically give you the speed, um, a speed output in your render node tree. So now that you've rendered your image out and it is uh, looking kind of the way you want it, we can get started compositing it. First things first though, press F3 to save your image. So I've already saved it out as a uh, multi-layer EXR file. You can't see a thumbnail because EXRs are huge and they don't really do thumbnails for them. Um, but to save the image, you press F3 and you will go to uh, your uh, save as image settings over here and click either the PNG and you usually want to set it to 16-bit depth. depth. Open EXR uh, set to RGBA for the alpha channel and float and uh, if you do that, you also want to include the Z buffer, which gives you the depth in the uh, uh, image, so you can use that uh, when you're compositing. Or you can use an open EXR multilayer. Since we're doing most of the compositing within Blender right now, it's best to just render out to open EXR multilayer so we can get all of the uh, render channels that we have on uh, activated within our render layer. Uh, settings. So uh, save it as something you can remember, put it in a nice place, and save it as an open EXR multi-layer so you have access to all those channels. So once you've saved it, you can call the image back in. Uh, so we are in our compositing screen right now. And as you can see here, I have my render layers node over here, a, a viewer node, and a composite node. Anything that you do uh, in the in the uh, compositing node tree basically eventually you want to route it all 
connect one end of the node tree to the other all the way down to this composite node and compo the composite node just calculates everything finalizes it and then allows you to save it out the viewer node can be input basically anywhere within your scene um, within your node tree and uh, will allow you to actively view different parts of your node setup so that you can see what exactly is happening um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but a quick, easy way to preview, no matter what, if you uh, don't have a viewer node sitting around and you're like, oh, I can't see anything. First things first, uh, the compositing window has this awesome backdrop feature. So it turns on the backdrop so you can see the image behind you. To scale in, press, or scale out, I'm sorry, press the V key and that will scale the image out. And then press uh, Control V not control the alt V to uh, scale in. So uh, yeah, activate backdrop and then you can control shift and click on your object to you or on your uh, node layer here to use a viewer node on it. Um, it'll connect the first output uh, here, like the first node socket basically to this viewer node for you. Um, this works in any node tree, so it's a great way to preview what you're doing anywhere in your node tree. And if you just keep clicking on your uh, node, whatever, whichever active node you have, it'll uh, send those outputs, whatever output you are selecting to that viewer node. So right now we're just going to use the image, uh, the normal image output to start and uh, place the viewer node over here. and down here you can see in your UV image editor to access it uh, this it should already be up if you're using the the, the one Lux uh, default file within the compositing scene if it is not up you will want to go ahead and uh, select it in the editor selection window uh, or sorry menu right here you got your 3d view all your animation views your uh, node editors and then more informational stuff up here so just select UV image editor and it'll pop up uh, this allows you to edit any edit and look at any image in here so I've got all the textures um, all the baking stuff the two environment maps and uh, or the two environment maps right here and then you have your render result and viewer node since you don't necessarily want to look at the compositor and you or the final composite while you're working and you don't really want to uh, calculate it twice because if you have a viewer node it's basically going to calculate it for the viewer node and then it's going to calculate it for the composite node uh, if it's connected to that you you just want to disconnect this composite node because you don't need it if you're viewing the render result uh, image basically it will disappear and that's okay you can still access what you're currently viewing by just clicking viewer node and you've got it back so sweet so this is our live preview over here um, I usually keep it up, but I will close it for now because we, we really don't need it. Um, and yeah, just leave it as kind of default and then use this for uh, checking larger sorts of details and I can work on the backdrop back here. If you ever want to full screen a any panel or any window within Blender, just press control and the up arrow with your mouse hovering in that area. So this just full screened the uh, viewer node, this full screens, the composite node, and you can even uh, full screen this panel over here. Yay, full screen panels. Uh, and just press escape to go back to previous. Uh, escape's not working. Just click back to previous. Okay, so we'll do a quick save, and we got that. Um, so you've, you've saved out your image or whatever, you've rendered it out, and it's now time to start compositing. So let's go ahead and grab it by pressing input, and if you are putting in multiple images to route into your node tree, you can press multiple image and select uh, as many <coughs> images as you want, and it'll create individual image nodes for them. Uh, since we're just using one node and not like an image sequence for an animation or multiple images, we're just going to load in one image. So. This will load in an image node here and go ahead and click open and navigate to where you saved your uh, multi-layer EXR file. So I'll load that in here. And as you can see, you have your composite layer here. Uh, that is the main composited image. I didn't have any effects on when I finished compositing 
when I started compositing my image, so no effects were really saved to that final composite layer. And you can also select the render layer. So if you have multiple render layers, they will all show up within here. So I'll select the first one. And now I'm going to get uh, all of my settings. All of these same things here uh, that are in my render layer are here in this image. I didn't save out the uh, speed vector, so I'm going to keep this render layer open uh, for now so I can access that. But outside of that, you're not going to, uh, I mean, best practice, just make sure you uh, make sure you save the file or re-render it if you need to with the, all those layers on. So, yes. Now, compositing. Uh, let's switch to this image we brought in. Just press Control shift click again to uh, preview it. Nothing should change. Oh, God. Okay. Nothing should change. Um, it's just the main uh, combined image that we rendered out. First thing we want to do is go over here to the scene panel. And this is where things get fun. If you open up the color management tab, I'm going to close all these because I don't need them. Open up the color management tab. You now have access, you can now manage the color of your scene. Um, and this is across all windows and all editors, everything. It changes all of the colors you are going to see. So I typically do not touch the color management panel until I have rendered out a compl like a completed uh, image. Until I'm completely done rendering, editing materials, and uh, getting my render settings right, I don't touch color management. Um, Depending on what settings you have active, if you try to render your scene again, uh, at least this used to be the case in Blender 2.75. I'm using 2.76B in this video. Um, but in 2.75 and even 2.76A, it would crash Blender. Like if you had uh, the film setting or, the, uh, or you're using curves or you had a specific uh, filter, an image filter on your in your color, man color management uh, panel. If you press the render button after applying all those or having all those effects active, it just crashes Blender and does so for no real good reason. Um, took me forever to figure out why it was doing that and it was very, very, very annoying. So best practice, just do it. Do the color management after you've uh, got your image. So first things first, you have Sorts of, all sorts of different options. If you have your display device here, um, and since we're using a HD, I'm using an HD TV, TV monitor, so I'm just gonna keep it at sRGB. That's mainly what you're gonna wanna use. Um, and then you can change your view. You can transform your view to emulate film, uh, RRT, which is Ray Render Transform, I believe, uh, raw color data, and logarithmic color data. So right now it's at default. If I change it to RRT, the colors change. If I change it to film, we get some more color change. Raw gives me basically just raw color values, and log will give me logarithmic, more washed out color values. So, for uh, the better of uh, the best effects, in my opinion, typically come out of this default setting. I mean, that's just norm normally what you're going to get, or switch to film. What film is going to do is ex both expand and compress your image. So anything that is dark, like very dark, close to black, it's it's going to crunch those blacks and push all the black values down. And so basically anything that should be black or should be very shadowed or dark is now going to be truly black according to this uh, viewing algorithm. Um, it is also by extension going to pull down some of your highlights. So you're not going to see as many specular highlights, some of the color, you're going to lose some of the color here, you're going to lose some of the color that you've got in the background back here, whatever. Um, but I typically go with film, especially if I'm rendering out an animation or, what, or something along those lines. So I've just gotten used to compositing with it and it's it's really fun. Um, it makes your images look great. Gleb Alexandrov has a really cool tutorial on film emulation. Um, and all, all his tutorials are, are great. They're really short and to the point. Not like these that kind of I, I start rambling. But it's, you know, it's fine. Um, 
But anyway, if you want a lot, if you want more information on film emulation and what it does, uh, talk to him. Look at his look at his uh, tutorial. I will uh, post a link to that in the description uh, as well, so you can check that out. So, anywho, you can tweak the exposure settings, so this will brighten your image back up a little bit. You can tweak the gamma setting, uh, which will change the uh, basically the gamma of the colors in your in your image. I typically leave this alone until I first edited my exposure. So when I first turn on, turn on excuse me, when I first turn on the film setting, it immediately changes my image to something that I typically don't like right away. So the first thing I'm going to do is go in here and tweak the exposure. And honestly, because this is so hyper real and bright, I'm going to turn the uh, exposure setting up to about 1.8 two five just to start from there uh, you can start looking at your gamma values you can turn the gamma values down to get a little bit more contrast and more saturation or turn the gamma values up to get less contrast and less saturation so gamma looks good right where it is it, it doesn't really need to go anywhere we can start adjusting highlight shadows and all that stuff here in the compositing uh, window now so after that's done uh, you can also choose to use curves and by using curves you can control the contrast in your image the red channel the green channel and the blue channel the blue channel as well as adjust black levels and white levels so if you want your red uh, white levels to be uh, a little bit lower then turn the red white level down if you want the blacks to be a little bit higher turn the black levels up this this effect right here is good for like underwater scenes or um, more dreamier scenes and filters and cool stuff. So, on top of that, um, there's a little reset button that you can use if you mess some things up and you just get tired of what you've been seeing. You can just reset this uh, image curve, look curve settings. Um, and you can also use a uh, filter. And these are all camera filters like you would find on like a Kodak or an Eastman or a Canon. Um, and these will change the look and feel of your uh, of your image very, very quickly. And I mean, you can play around with these all day long. There's there's tons of them in here, and they will they will just change up your your image totally for you um, if you don't want to manually composite. Uh, but the downside is that there's so many, so it takes a while to find one that really looks good. So we're just going to go in and manually make this boss. Um, first things first, we're going to color balance everything. So you want to add in a color balance node to your combined output. So click and drag that in. From there, you have lift, gamma, and gain values. Gain values are going to control the highlights. Gamma values are going to control more of the midtones and more of the main colors you see. And lift is going to control the shadows. Or, yeah, the shadows. So, first things first, we don't want to do any color correction right now. Uh, we just want to adjust the shadows and uh, midtones and highlights. So, first things first is just start playing around with these values until you get something that starts to look good. I want a little bit more contrast here in the shadows and the crevices, so I turned that up. I brought this down just a little bit. And then I'm going to bring the gamma value up some to adjust the color back up. So this is the regular version. This is the colored, color balanced version. It's not much of a difference, really, but all you're seeing it here, all you're seeing it. Eh, I can't talk. It's 2 a.m. What you're seeing here is the normal image right now, lighter shadows, more color, uh, or sorry, more washed out color. And here I have darkened the shadows and, uh, yeah, and brought up the color a little bit more. And that looks good. And then lastly, if you have highlights that you want to edit, you can uh, move over here to this uh, color correction for highlights, and that'll change that up. So let's push those up a little bit and see what we get. That's really starting to blow it out now. Um, I'm going to leave that as is. You can, after you've color balanced once, you can color balance again. And this is 
good practice if in the first pass, in the first color balance pass, you really want to focus on uh, affecting your uh, white and black values. So the level of shadowing, the level of the midtones, and the level of the highlights. You want to you wanna go ahead and edit those there first. Then you add in another color balance node right on top of the first one. And this is where you can start actually balancing the color out. So if you want to take out some red from the shadows, uh, or sorry, that was adding red. If you want to take out some red, switch it to like the complementary color, blue. So the shadows are going to get a little bit bluer now. Um, you don't like this blue on the midtone, but you like the blue color class, color cast in the highlights. So let's add some more orange in the mids. And that's that's way too much. Uh, I'm gonna see. Let's see here. Just till you get an effect that you like. And I honestly think this pinkish over here is really nice um, because you have some of those pinks in the background here. You have some of those pinks in your. Uh, uh, what do you call it, your bokeh nodes. So I changed that up a little bit. And because you just have a few of these uh, green highlights, that's what I'm going to go for on the highlight end of the spectrum. So I'm gonna edit that to be a little bit more green. Um, and we're going to go more like a greenish. Eh, I may not change that. If I do want to change that, I'm going to go over here to use curves and push the greens uh, using the curve. So uh, down here is going to push the greens closer for most of the image, uh, whereas here up, up towards the top is going to push greens for more of the highlighted values. So any value at this level here. So you can imagine these points, uh, if I add points in right here, you can imagine these points as points like these little intersections here, you can imagine them as like quarter increments. So this is zero, this is 0.25, this is 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and one. Um, so let me reset this. Um, so at any, any value, any color value that uh, like right now, this uh, most of the colors here, I'm sorry, in this correction formula, I have the color set to a value of one, but this color value here is like a color value of 0 0.002. So any color value basically between the scale of zero and one is going to be editable on this curve. So values closer to the top of the scale, like these lighter values, if I push the greens up here, are going to get more green than the darker values, that sort of thing. So this allows for a great deal of control in what gets green or what gets what colors get changed and what don't. Um, so I'm going to bring these guys back down to earth down here. And I'm also going to bring them back down to earth down here. But starting at about 0.5 and above, I'm going to start bringing my greens up. And may even start doing so over here. And let me buff this curve out. Yeah. That's looking great. Okay, so done some editing to the curve. You can go in and change the contrast up to really start pushing things uh, in a different direction. I'm just gonna reset that. Um, oh crap! I'm don't don't hit the reset button uh, if you. Yeah, don't don't hit the reset button um, if you've done a lot of curve color correction color correction because it resets it for all of your uh, all of your colors so yes um, that is honestly better I mean you can really see it like here and here and that's what needs to be that's what needs to be smoothed out and fixed some uh, we're gonna delete that point right there because I don't need it. 
this one is a little hard to get to, and I mean, you can Photoshop that, this little bokeh area right there. You can Photoshop that out. It doesn't really need to be fixed in here. So that's mainly color and shadows. Uh, now we get to do some more fun effects. Um, First off, you it may be in good practice to go ahead and split up your uh, main object from your scene now. So I have already started uh, looking at doing that. I have an ID mask node. You can ac access that by going into press Shift A to access your nodes and pull up the converter menu and select ID mask. And so that's going to bring one of those guys in. Um, so for your ID value, you want to, uh, you can select the index up here. So either index zero, which has m all of the rest of the scene on it, or index one, which is what I separated the Gorgon onto. And plug in the index OB, index object value, into here. And what this is going to do is mask out your uh, all your objects that are on that layer. So if I go back to index zero, it is now masking out uh, the background and not accounting for this guy. So we're going to do two of them. One for the Gorgon and one on index zero for the uh, environment. And so these are getting masked here. Uh, I also am including a blur node because if you look in close, this is all pixelated and gross in here. So I have selected quadratic blur, which is uh, very heavy blurring. Um, and I have also done, uh, given it a size of seven each or an amount of seven each in the X and Y directions. Uh, if you want to preview this, just control shift, click on it. And as you can see now, this is way smoother and will produce a much better, uh, much better effect. You can use cubic, which is even more accurate. Um, I'll switch to that cause that looks, it looks quite a bit, quite a bit better. So we have those masked out. I'm going to do a little save here. Um, and now we want to apply specific effects to each, each, uh, each part of this image. So what you want to do now is add in a converter and no, it's a color alpha over node. And we are going to um, make sure that is exactly what we want to do. I am pretty sure it is. Um, yeah, let's just go with it. Okay, so we have our two images. We're going to take the color balance node and the last color balance node because we've, we've already adjusted the colors as we want them to feel the way we want them to feel together. Uh, so we're going to just keep that main thing here. Um, so as you can see, it's alphaing over this white image that we have in here. It's nothing. If I turn it down to black, uh, gray, whatever, it's going to alpha that over top. I'm going to plug this blur node in as the factor. So now it is alphaing out all of this background crap over here. Um, so yeah, that's, that's great but we will also want to do this for the uh excuse me we want to do this for both for both objects so i'm going to duplicate this node and do it again and i'm going to duplicate this blur node down here and connect my second id mask to it um, i'm going to take this color balance node the final color balance and plug it into the top and take the blur node and plug it into the factor input. And if we preview this one, it is now masking out all of the white background behind it. Okay, so I was incorrect in leading you down this path um, with alphaing over ID masks. There's there's no really there's really no point in doing that unless you're just basically trying to completely separate an object um, and use it for something else and like uh, composite it in to your to your scene. Um, you don't even really need these blur nodes. So and I'll I'll show you. Excuse me. I will show you why that is 
that is the case now. Um, so if I have my image and I want to change its uh, hue, saturation, or value, we'll plug that in here. Let's say I just want to mess with this guy, okay? I, I just want to mess with the Gorgon. Let's take the alpha ID mask of index one, which is what all the Gorgon is mapped to, and plug it into here. Now, I can just change the value of the Gorgon itself. Change saturation, whatever, and it's not going to affect anything back here. So that's how you ID mask. It's 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 useful. Um, you use it as the factor input for uh, nodes you want specific effects on. So, who now I am going to go ahead and throw on a like blurring effect, not a blurring, a uh, glaring effect. I'm sorry. So. We're going to connect our uh, color balance node here. And with this glare, you have different options, ghost, streaks, fog, whatever. Ghost is the one I used on the uh, image that's on the website, so we're going to start with that. And let's see here. You want to change the threshold because the glare filter is only going to apply two pixels brighter than a value of one. We don't have any of those pixels in our image because we're, we're, we're doing this linearly. So um, you have to change this. So if you want it to affect the whole image, go to zero. And now it's going to affect everything. Cool. Um, if you want to fine tune that, just slowly adjust. And it looks great right about in here. That That is a very slight, simple, you know, effect. Um, change the, you can change the iterations to uh, increase the amount that's happening. That looks good there. And you can also change the color modulation so that it decreases the effect and modulates the color closer to the values that are, uh, the colors that are present in the scene. So we're going to do a glare node, a ghost glare node there. And we're also going to add one more in uh, on top. And we're going to use our ID mask here uh, for that for that effect. So what we want to do now is we want to do that alpha over uh, blurring thing that we were doing before. So let's go ahead and add back, add that alpha, uh, where are you, sir? Add that alpha node, alpha over node back in. And we're going to use the, uh, we're just doing it on the Gorgon. So we're going to use the Gorgon ID mask here. And we're going to take the combined image and plug it in up top. So now you can see that it is that is not the one I wanted. I want the ID this ID mask. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and now you're going to see how that how that's starting to work. So I'm going to set the background to black because I don't need it as anything. And um, essentially, I'm going to composite just this by itself and then layer it back in on top of my image. So let's add a bit of blurring if we can here. So go to filter and select blur. I'm going to use my um, cubic blur like I did last time. Set it seven, set it seven and plug this in on top. And that should give me a slight blur effect around the edges here. Variable size. That is more than I wanted. Let's plug the size in and it'll uh, plug the ID mask into the size and it'll specify to just blur around the edges where the background image, the backplate, and the uh, Gorgon are meeting. So blurring setup, alpha overing is set up. Now let's apply the glare effect. We're going to use a uh, fog glow glare, I believe. We're going to start there and see how that goes. Let's turn the threshold down to zero. And now the whole thing is glowing. And it looks a little it looks a little washed out. It's just, nah, not what I want. So you can go to streaks, which gives you this streaking effect. And you can also go to simple star, which gives you just basic starry, uh, more specular based uh, um glaring. So I'm going to do that and set it to high quality so I get the best quality glare effect. Mm, turn the iterations up so that I get more of those stars. 
and then start uh, adjusting the threshold. So you're seeing the stars here, like this right here is that simple star effect. And that looks pretty good right there. I mean, comparing that uh, to the glared simple star, it, it, I like that a lot. You can turn the threshold up even higher and it'll decrease the effect. Also changing the mix value will decrease the amount. Uh, will will change the how much of the glare is mixed into the image. I'm just going to leave it at uh, default. It, it's fine there. So now we're going to composite that back in over top of our combined uh, glare effect. So shift D to duplicate shift D to duplicate the alpha over node and connect uh, the glare image to the top and then connect this glare uh, image from our main combined node to the bottom. And now you have our our glared second image over top of our glared first image. So that's what that one looks like and that's what this one looks like with them both together. Very cool. Very very cool. Um, let me check one more thing here. Yeah, nothing's really happening there. Okay, cool. So, that extra glare effect, that extra popping effect is now here. Uh, it, it's it's present. It's doing its it's doing its thing. Um, other than that, I really don't do much else in uh, Blender. I, I, most of my other compositing is done either in Nuke or in uh, Photoshop. So Blender has all these great nodes for mainly for compositing, say, uh, more so animations and image sequences for still images. Like this is this is about all you really need to do in Blender to make it. I mean, it, we're we're at a decent level here in terms of image quality. It looks it looks okay. <laughs> I'll I'll take it. Um, you know, this is this is about all you need to do to get your image to start looking, start looking right. Um, so, I think we're going to stop there. The last thing uh, we're going to do here is add in the uh, speed, the uh, motion blurring. So. To add in the speed setting, uh, the motion blur that I applied earlier, um, we just need one node, basically. Uh, we need the render layer that has the speed on it. So if you didn't save that with a file, um, you want to call your render layer and take the speed output. And all we need is a vector blur node. And we're going to plug that up here. Bingo. Now take the speed output and plug that into the speed input. And from here, you can go on and start blurring your image, um, vector blurring your image. Uh, sorry. Let's turn this back to zero. This is just default. Uh, zero for none it, do, it doesn't affect it really and then uh, plug in your z value as well uh, just for good measure um, maybe useful if you have different images that you want to map with the uh, z axis on so uh, turn the blurring up uh, you can just turn it up to like five see what happens mm, nothing 50 mm, nothing oh 20 is the max why is it not blurring? Herm. I don't know why it's not doing that. Interesting. Uh... That is really 
really strange. I don't know why it's doing that. Huh. No clue. Well, I'm just going to add it back in uh, normally because I have it saved uh, here by itself already. I'm just going to add it back into our no tree by itself. I'm going to replace our main image from the one I saved out with the speed vector input. I'm going to have to look into that and see why it's doing that. So let's go ahead and delete this vector blur node. We don't need it. And apply the alpha over node. And now we're getting that vector blur effect as if it's, as if it's moving. Last, last thing to really sort of sell your image. This is a tip by Gleb Alexandrov. It involves a uh, lens distortion node. Lens distortion, lens distortion is basically chromatic aberration on your camera. Um, it's the how it's basically your camera is not a perfect object, so it sorts it it distorts things and gives you a very interesting effect. So we're going to apply that now. Um, we're going to uh, we don't really need to mess with these very much. Um, but if you check this out, if I turn this all the way up to one, it, it really, really distorts the image. So we're going to go for a much smaller value, uh, like 0.01. <laughs> that, that is about all we want. If you select fit, it will fit the image back to, if you're getting this black, uh, this black tearing, because the image is distorting with the lens, just press fit and it will fit it back to the plane as it should. Um, and then turn on dispersion. And so dispersion is going to give you that chromatically aberrated effect around the edges. And we don't want that much. We want like 0.03. Yeah, that's, that's a lot better. And now it's chromatically aberrated a little bit and looks cool. Um, yes. So good stuff there. I bumped it up to 0.043 just to... Uh, just to mess with it. And you can even turn on jittering. Uh, it's a little bit noisier, but that could also push the realism a little bit. So, I mean, if you want that jittered, noisy, kind of grainy look, uh, lens distortion gives you that. All right. Now that everything is done, um, you want to take the, uh, what do you call it? You want to take your alpha and your Z channel from your main render layer and plug it in to your composite node as, as well as your main image. So plug that in, plug, the, plug all those values in now so you can output them with your final composited uh, render. And I'll also plug them into the viewer. They should not do anything though. Um, it's just the information that is going to be written to the file, essentially. And that is basically it. I also saved out all these other passes that you can see here. So, uh, ambient occlusion, I can use that to add back in some more shadow depth, uh, and that sort of thing. Give some more, that gives some more depth to my shadows, basically. Uh, the emission just has these emission, um, these bokeh particles here. So, I can mess with that directly. Uh, this is just the environment background, so it gets rid of all that emission emission stuff. Uh, and then I also have uh, direct channel. So since I really don't have much diffuse lighting, you're not going to see any. And I don't really have much diffuse indirect lighting either, because we are mainly using uh, metallic textures. So the glossy channel has a lot of information on it. And uh, I could go in and do some editing here and composite it back in like we did with our uh, two images. It's basically the same sort of workflow. I can composite this glossy uh, direct lighting pass back in with some changes done to it uh, to, mainly, to maybe change the color of those glossy reflections or add some more cool effects. Um, and then glossy indirect, I could composite this and push these values a little bit to embellish the fact that this is a like very glossy material. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of stuff you can do when you enable the render passes. Um, so this has been just a basic look at how to uh, composite in uh, Blender 3D and sort of the workflow I use whenever I have created an image and really want to uh, 
push the push the push the hyper realism, push the values, and you know make it make the image kind of sing, make it pop a little bit. I mean, this isn't this is by no means a perfect image. There there's a whole side of this missing. There's a lot of background information missing. Like I could add some trees and a lake and some a, some water effects and like all sorts of cool stuff in in here. Um, but that would take a lot of time, and that's time you guys don't have. So I'm going to quit wasting it rambling and, you know, go go get blending. Happy blending to everyone, and I hope these hope this tutorial series has, you know, helped you kind of figure out how to get going in Blender quickly and uh, adjust to more of a studio-oriented uh, production pipeline.